No? Can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much. So welcome everybody to the last plenary session of our conference and a very warm welcome to our distinguished guests from the Wildlife Conservation Society of India. Very welcome and honored that you're here and uh, hope it is also useful and interesting for you to have, well, we're gonna have an international perspective, but anyway, to be in this Dutch uh, uh, community. So thank you very much for joining us. So um, this session is gonna consist of two parts. Uh, first one is two plenary lectures by Meredith Gore and Andrew Lemieux, and I'll introduce them in a bit. And then immediately afterwards, we'll have the Willem Nagel Prize Award, which is the most distinguished, prestigious award in criminology you can get in the Netherlands for your thesis. It's only once every two years, so this is a very special moment this afternoon. Okay, so we're gonna get started right away. And the first one to speak is Meredith Gore, who is from the University of Maryland, and she is Associate Professor of Human dimensions of environment, no, environmental mm -hmm, change, no. What was it again? <laughs> I'd written it down. Global, global, environment. global environmental change, that's it. Okay, and Andrew Lemieux, that's easier. You're just senior researcher at NSCR. <laughs> Just a researcher, okay, well, I just promoted you. That's good, okay, good. So Meredith, the floor is yours, go ahead. Can you hear me? I can hear myself also. I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you so much to all of you for the invitation to come. And I have really enjoyed my experience so far. I apologize, I only speak English. And so I've done my best to uh, listen and learn and converse. And I have really enjoyed my conversation so far. Um, so I'm here today to discuss some of my research, some of my um, experiences and hopefully provoke some conversation. And also I have a goal of optimism. If you take anything away from my talk today, I hope it's opportunity, opportunity, opportunity to collaborate. So um, what I would like to do is speak about opportunities to deepen the integration of conservation and crime sciences. And so I want to just start off by acknowledging that I'm incredibly motivated every morning I get up uh, because I'm motivated to do interdisciplinary science. And so I'm very privileged to be able to um, engage in science that crosses disciplinary boundaries. Um, I do a lot of work in international contexts, uh, junior scientists. Um, I fail a lot. And so I want to just acknowledge that what I'm going to present today is mostly the successes, but if it wasn't for the failures, there would be no learning. Um, and I'm very motivated to do science for society. I wake up in the morning because I want to do science that matters to decision makers. So um, we are here talking about crimes that impact the planet. So today I would like to uh, talk a little bit about nature crime and why nature crime matters. Um, I tend to define nature crime or conservation crime as any deviant human behavior or deviant human use of natural resources. Um, and so nature crime can be a cause of social conflict, um, you know, when, and it can also be a consequence of social conflict. And so I think that multi-directionality is really important to think about. Nature crime threatens species, it also threatens ecosystems, and it also threatens human livelihoods. In some instances, nature crime converges with other serious crimes like money laundering, state capture, gun trafficking, narco deforestation, um, and we've heard many other examples uh, at the conference this week. So just so that we are all kind of on the same page about what we're thinking about when it comes to talking about environmental crime, um, I thought I'd provide some examples, right? So uh, an example that Andrew and I are gonna talk a lot about is wildlife poaching and wildlife trafficking, right? And so this would be an example when somebody kills a rhino, takes their horn and sells it on a black market, they're breaking the law, right? There's, there's, there's animal protection laws, there's trade laws, um, other kinds of laws. Um, and so, you know, we do talk about breaking the law in conservation crime, but we also talk about breaking the rules, right? And so you might have individuals that are um, grazing their cattle out of season in a particular area that results in increased deforestation from in increased land erosion, which then results in these massive lavacas, these erosion canyons, for example, in um, Madagascar. Without telling you how old I am, does anyone wanna guess how old this erosion canyon is. I'll just say it's about my age, right? And it's really, really big. Um, and so it's 
incredible that canyons can form like this in a very short amount of time, because I'm actually 29. I'll just tell you, right? So there's all kinds of other um, nature crimes that we can talk about. There's illegal fishing, there's land grabs, there's plant crime, there's illegal trafficking in orchids, cactuses, charcoal, um, there's sand mining, there's uh, you know, trafficking for uh, minerals like cobalt um, and rubies and sapphires and diamonds. A lot, of a lot of times we have uh, types of medicine crime. So wildlife that's trafficked illegally to be used in animal testing or animals that are used for um, just medicine like reptiles, insects, mushrooms. There's illegal trade in e-waste. There's fraud in, carbon in the carbon credit markets. Um, pretty, pretty much anywhere there's an opportunity for a human to interact with a natural resource, there's an opportunity for crime. So um, why does this matter? Uh, this is not just an issue that uh, gets me up in the morning. Uh, the World Economic Forum does this annual global risk perception survey. The 22, 2022 results came out in January. And so what they do is they rank five different classifications of risk. And in 2022, what you can see is that the first, second, and third top rated risks were in the environmental space, right? And so it's climate change failure, extreme weather, and biodiversity loss. Um, the debt crisis is ninth. Right, so, so environmental uh, risks are, are very front, front and center for a lot of individuals. They also rank short-term risks, right? So over the next zero to two years, um, you know, extreme weather is up there as being the top short-term global related risk. Also climate action failure, livelihood crises, which I would add are gonna cause a biodiversity crisis. You can also think about this in terms of um, uh, longer term risks. And if you think in the longer term, the top five uh, long term risks are in this environmental space, right? So climate action, biodiversity loss, natural resource crises, human environmental damage. Um, don't worry, we will be optimistic when this is when this is over. It's we will do this. Uh, we, we can do it. Um, so I'll just try it this way. Right, so um, sometimes individuals like to think about transnational environmental crime or environmental crime in dollars. In US dollars, it's billions of money, billions of dollars. Um, there are multiple estimates out there. Uh, these estimates vary, but for the most part, we're talking upwards of you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And these, these estimates, frankly, are, are quite old at this point. Um, environmental crime, nature crime connects us all. This is a flow map for global rhino horns. Um, and you can essentially see that, you know, horns fl flow from Mozambique to China. They flow from Angola to Laos. They flow from uh, Swaziland to Taiwan, or East Watini, excuse me, to Taiwan. We're all connected, as we all know from the global pandemic. Uh, these flows connect us all in new ways. Why does it matter? Why should we be thinking about nature crime? First is violence. This violence threatens people, it threatens animals, um, it threatens ecosystem. The rule of law is undermined. We have uh, you know, an undermined rule of law for nature. We have undermined rules of law in other sectors of society that we care about. Sustainable development investments are undermined. They're uh, degraded, um, they're excluded. Taxable revenue is removed from legal supply chains. Cultural resources, um, oops, this should be reversed. Cultural resources are degraded and excluded and then sustainable development returns are, uh, are decreased. We also have zoonotic diseases and invasive species. We have new pathways that are created and used. Um, so it really does matter. These are really things that we should be thinking about. I take an interdisciplinary approach to this, to these problems. I think that science has something to offer. Interdisciplinary science is, is one way of thinking about this issue. So when you take rule and harm violations and you start to think about the body of knowledge and methods and tools from, from you know, essentially criminology and criminal justice, problem-based policing, crime prevention, you also have natural resources and natural resource management and policy, the biology, the ecology matters. And then you have human behavior, risk and decision sciences. And so when you smush it all together, you can have an interdisciplinary approach to thinking about this. So I go, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to do a lot of interdisciplinary science. I have active research projects in Mexico, South Africa, Mozambique, Madagascar, and Vietnam. 
And so this interdisciplinary science is amazing. I love it. Again, it gets me up in the morning, but there are challenges. It challenges traditional planning and management structures. It challenges power, it challenges knowledge bases, and that can make it hard. But I still think that it's worthwhile to explore. Uh, interdisciplinary science is incredibly important for policymaking, for governance, for management of natural resources. It advances our scientific understanding and introduces new tools. It also it broadens diversity, diversity of the science and also the scientists, right? And so this advances innovation, the robustness of scientific findings and social relevance. So what I wanna do is speak a little bit though about, so, so hopefully I've convinced you, if you are not already convinced that interdisciplinary science is, has value um, and is worth kind of engaging more in. in. However, um, interdisciplinary science linking crime and conservation, it's really limited so far. What I found from a review of literature um, is that really we have only six crime science kind of tools, techniques that have been applied in conservation related crime. So there's lots of room for growth here. Um, and as I was reviewing the literature um, with my colleague, thinking about this within the context of sea cucumber trafficking in Mexico, we identified um, kind of five overarching challenges uh, to, to engaging in interdisciplinary science. And so I would like to present those here today, hopefully food for thought. Um, but these challenges are based on the characteristics of interdisciplinary science, right? So uh, the work that I do involves field work. I know not all science involves field work. Um, there's lots of room for everybody here. Uh, a lot of the times I'm collecting primary data. The uh, research approach can be inductive and deductive, and it can be, empirical as well as theoretical. Um, so sometimes we call this a kitchen sink of science, right? We're just kind of throwing everything in to solve these real world problems. So five challenges facing the future of interdisciplinary conservation and crime science. First of all, there's a broad range of harms and victims. Um, in conservation, we have an individual animal and then we also have populations of animals. So how can we best scale the relative specificity of crime science um, to do the diffusion of the victims that we have and the harms that are associated with nature. So again, sometimes there's an individual animal and then there's a population. Uh, sometimes we're dealing about loss, misfortune, violence and damage, but we're not dealing with broken laws. So this broad range of harms and victims is something to think about as we move forward. There's also incredible scalar mismatches in human behavior and the jurisdictions and governance mechanisms that we have to manage human behavior. So we have criminal activity, which doesn't match the same scale as the natural resource system, which doesn't match the scale of the jurisdictional scale um, and doesn't always match our crime prevention strategies. So we have these ecologically relevant scales like an ecosystem, which may cross multiple um, you know, criminal justice jurisdictions. Um, and so this is something that we need to kind of rectify as we're moving forward. Of course, we have legal use of natural resources right now. And so nature crimes often resemble um, legal supply chains and legal use, right? So natural resource use can be sustainable. It can be legal. It can be governed. It can generate benefits for different stakeholders. But illegal products often hide in plain sight. Um, and this can create some challenges to uh, trying to prevent risks associated with conservation crimes. In conservation, we are renowned for creating laws without consultation. Um, I can't speak to other sectors, but a lot of the times we have rules and, and, and laws that are established without the consultation of natural resource users, without their traditional ecological knowledge, without, their, without sufficient understanding of these human environment uh, relationships. And in some cases, there's just no legitimacy of the rules, right? So um, tra traditional people and traditional resource users um, suffer because of these laws. Um, and it actually can really serve to the detriment of resource dependent people. The fifth idea is that natural science matters in the rule of law. When it comes to burglary, when it comes to homicide, when it comes to larceny, um, there's certainly social science that goes into making laws, but I don't know so much about how natural science goes into this. But when we're talking about regulating illegal fishing, wildlife trafficking, use of minerals, um, the legality and illegality of natural resources really depends on natural science insight, which a lot of the times is uncertain. <laughs> um, and this creates um, an additive dimension that may, not be pop that may not be present for other kinds of traditional ki uh, crimes, for example, um, homicide or larceny. So these are five challenges that I think 
um, face the integration of, of conservation and crime sciences. But I'm an optimist. I'm a glass half full type of scientist. I'm up here on stage with somebody who has a glass half full type of, uh, uh, of outlook. And so I see lots of opportunity. Um, in my, sorry, in my research, um, I have an opportunity to engage with the private sector, particularly um, you know, online companies, companies that are involved in transportation. There's different donors out there, governments, industry, um, foundations that I think are really interested in funding this kind of interdisciplinary science. And I think there's amazing opportunities for theory. Um, every time I talk to a scientist from a different field, I essentially say to them, I can break your theory. The conservation, the situation on the ground never fits existing theories, which means that these theories need to be enhanced, they need to be adapted, they need to be improved. Um, and so conservation is a great way to kind of, frankly, break your theoretical models and your methods because it never seems to fit. Um, I would love for there to be one of them out there that fits, but to date, I haven't found one. So I'm gonna close. Um, hopefully I've provoked some thinking about opportunities to integrate conservation and crime sciences, some of the challenges that we face that I think can be overcome. And um, here's my contact information, some of my recent publications. And I think with that, um, I think we had hoped that there might be a couple of questions for me before Andrew speaks. And then after you speak, you'll take a couple of questions and then we can all have a conversation together about um, kind of the future of, of, of integration. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, the floor is open for just a few questions, maybe for Meredith. Anyone? Yeah, go ahead, Wim. Uh, I think in uh, continental Europe, UK, and also Australia, colleagues have been working on similar topics under the umbrella of green criminology, mm -hmm. in particular the, the, the concept of conservation criminology. Can you uh, tell us about the differences, or is this the same? Is it just an American? I think there's a lot of differences, um, and I really appreciate the question. Um, I do have a paper on that, so. Uh, but uh, you know, to 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 summarize, uh, I think conservation criminology takes a systems approach, and it's it's bi-directional. It also recognizes harms to and from ecosystems, um, and so um, I think that there is a um, a unidirectional focus a lot of the time that that the green criminology takes um, and doesn't always take a systems approach. So those would be some of the biggest differences that I see um, in practice. Um, but if there's others um, that kind of stand, I don't know if anything stands out to you. Um, put you on the spot there. Yeah, I, I think I think um, at the end of the day. Um, I personally am more interested in bringing science for decision making and science for solutions. And so, what theory you call it, or kind of what you integrate, is less important than how it's integrated and how reliable and valid the results are on the ground. Is there some explanation for the, for the difference? Is it also from various backgrounds? That of the scientists that are working. Certainly, certainly, right. And also the inclusion of risk and decision sciences, which under, right, so risk and decision sciences has a lot of overlap with um, rational choice, uh, you know, for example, that's one that kind of stands out. But there are um, others out there, risk analysis, risk communication, risk management, also participatory methods for uh, generating data and analyzing data that I think, um, the the field of risk and decision science really really brings to bear there, and then there's also this like serious uh, ecological knowledge base that I think is sometimes lacking from 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 green criminology and and incorporation of the natural science perspective um, in the in the generation of the science. Opportunity, opportunity, opportunity means that there's opportunity for collaboration between the both. Absolutely. Absolutely, right. And then I learn a lot about the difference between criminology and crime science when I engage with Andrew and his colleagues, right? And so I also understand that there's an opportunity for theory building and then also this kind of crime science approach on the ground. So um, I'm not the one to speak about that, but there is an opportunity. 
Any other question for now before we continue? Yes, go ahead, Evelyn and then Wim. You're together? Okay. <laughs> The large majority of my work right now is trying to understand the structure and dynamics of wildlife trafficking networks. And I'm really trying to um, understand, uh, well, I have, I, have, I have one project that's trying to look at how wildlife trafficking networks either serve to constrain or spread anthrax and how biosecurity monitoring for anthrax and biosecurity monitoring or security monitoring for wildlife trafficking across international borders can enhance decision making about both. Um, so a lot of the times I'm trying to unify data to enhance decision making. Um, but it's wildlife traffic. All of my funded work right now is on wildlife trafficking. All of it involves an online dimension. All of it involves computer scientists and operation engineers, um, as well as geographers, conservationists, and criminologists. Thanks. Vim, you still have a question? No? OK. Suppose that we continue with Andrew. Yeah. Is this is this working? I think it is. Excellent. Works. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, big thanks to the organizers for having me here today, giving a keynote, my first keynote, I think. I've spoken at the end of a conference, but I wasn't the keynote. I was just the last guy to talk. So um, it's nice to be here. It's really nice to share the stage with Meredith. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. We try to bring our networks together as often as possible. We try to share lessons learned given our different backgrounds and our different strengths. Um, and, and my talk today is very much building off of Meredith, which is why we, we met earlier in the week to sort of see who would go first. And I think Meredith laid a great found work for, foundation for um, how would science look at this in a more maybe holistic way? And what I wanna talk about today is how would you then operationalize that on the ground? Okay, and I'll explain that as we go through. But the, the title of my talk here is Wildlife Protection is a Wicked Problem. And this is really a vision I have for improving science and practice in this sphere. And I start um, with this great quote from Edward Game and colleagues paper that he says, conservation is not rocket science, it's much, much harder. And he's really talking to some of these issues that Meredith touched on, the interrelatedness of problems um, and basically comparing it to launching a rocket you have these laws of physics. We haven't done that in, in sociology and criminology yet. So when things fail, it's less clear. And really the point here is what they were pushing for is these are wicked problems. And wicked problems is a framework that was de developed in the 1970s. And wicked problems have different features. And here's an example taken from a, a marine environment group. But some of the ones I wanna point out today is that you know every problem in wildlife protection is unique. Um, solutions are not true or false. They're good or bad, basically. A solution is often a one-shot operation where every chance we get to do something about it counts, okay? And every wicked problem is a symptom of another one. Um, and if you're interested in wicked problems, I would definitely say dive into the literature. Today, I don't want to get too much into it, but I just want to lay this, this idea that these problems don't exist in isolation, as Meredith kind of pointed to. Another way to think about this is I always like Malcolm Sparrow's visualization of a knot. And he said, if you wanted to untie this knot, you wouldn't just pull any string, you would need to look and see how are they connected, start pulling them, you'd realize that by pulling one, another one gets tighter. Okay, these are what wicked problems really are. Um, and there's also this classic example of the balloon, right? If a balloon is a wicked problem, and I want to solve the problem, when I squeeze the balloon, unless I find a way to let air out of it, I simply just move the problem away. Or as I reduce one problem here, I make it bigger in another area. Okay, these are wicked problems, which require very, very different ways of thinking about how to solve them. It's not easy by any means. As I said, there may not even be a solution or the solution is going to be the best option, not the actual working option. And I, I spent most of my career working with law enforcement teams around the world or the NGOs supporting them. And, and I really come back to this quote a lot because here we are trying to solve wicked problems, but we only have one tool really if we're a law enforcement agency. And so if you, if the only tool you have is a hammer, all your problems start to look like nails. This is very much what's happening in the field. And we need to find different ways to think about this, okay? 
And what we're, what's also interesting is when we look at how we're trying to solve these wicked problems, whether it's law enforcement or whether it's NGOs supporting them, and we compare it to Braithwaite's responsive regulatory pyramid, we're stuck up here for the most part. We're trying to enforce deterrence models that are also sometimes leading to incapacitation. But again, the, the sort of assumptions for these models is that either we have irrational actors, which trust me, poachers are not irrational actors most of the time. They are rational actors, but we often fail to meet the requirements of a deterrent theory to get it to work. Restorative justice, um, the NSCR just had a nice lecture series on restorative justice for environmental harms. These are big question marks though. Nobody really knows how we can use this yet. That's why I organized the series. I really learned a lot, okay? And there is capacity building happening to try to reduce these wicked problems. But my argument is that largely these are devoid from law enforcement operations. So NGOs are doing awareness raising. They're trying to work with the learning citizen, but they're doing it at 10 o'clock in the morning when the learning citizen is already collecting wood in the forest. Okay, they're not matching what law enforcement knows about deviance or unwanted behavior to the awareness. The learning citizen should be the person who isn't doing um, what they're supposed to. Okay, and I think also when we look at the, the, the approach that's being used in this idea of deterrence, if we simplify the criminal justice system, as I call it, the gears of justice, um, you have these different things that happen. Each one's run by a different agency. Each one has different priorities and each one is very likely to fail. And if we're trying to put people through the gears of justice to change them, and one of these gears fails, all for nothing, okay? And the amount of times I spent, I spent a lot of time with Ranger teams and the frustrations they felt about making a good arrest and watching it fall apart in court, that's demotivating. And what does that lead to? Well, not doing your job well because it's not paying off when you do it well. Okay, so these are things that really challenge this model. Not to mention, by the way, that when you go up this model, it's more expensive as well. So we're choosing the most expensive, most aggressive models to try to control a problem in systems that are broken or largely, they're, they're really easy to make fail. So getting deterrence to work is hard, measuring it is also not easy. And I'll give a very quick overview of some work that just came out that we did in Malawi prisons um, as a collaboration with Michelle Newberry from the University of Southampton and the Longway Wildlife Trust, where we asked convicted ivory traffickers some questions about their perceptions of risk, about the impact of their incarceration. Well. Most important finding, there was very, very weak evidence that there was any general deterrent effect being caused by arrest. Most people didn't even know they were breaking the law, right? Nobody really, the majority didn't think it was risky. Only 11% of people knew somebody that had been arrested before, which if you want a general deterrent effect, you need that to be a lot higher. This is a great one here. Only 11% thought they were caught because of good police work, right? So clearly, and also we have mainly opportunistic people making spur of the moment decisions to get involved. If this is the case and you have a broken deterrent system, we're not getting that. Now, when you ask them how, you know, if they would offend again, specific deterrence was extremely high. I've been in jail, this is terrible, I will not do this again. But specific deterrence in the absence of general deterrence is pointless in my opinion, okay? And then when we also ask them, what would you do? They really highlighted capacity building as what they would say. Again, if you don't even know it's breaking the law, how would you be worried about a deterrent effect? And this is where we start to ask ourselves, if the only tool I have is a hammer and it's broken, I need some new tools, right? I definitely need new tools in a law enforcement agency. And that's what I really try to do um, in my work with the Center for Problem Oriented Policing and the board that Meredith sits on, our editorial board, for finding ways to help law enforcement find better solutions. And largely what we do is we draw from the problem oriented policing literature. Problem oriented policing is A, a proven policing strategy that works, or at least is proven uh, in meta-analyses to have impacts on crime but also it's something that recognizes the wickedness and the uniqueness of individual crime problems. Problem oriented policing is driven by the SARA process. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, some of you are, but the idea here is by bringing a framework an almost scientific approach to looking at problems, we start to help law enforcement agencies better identify solutions based on evidence um, and, and also to create evidence, also, which I'll speak about in a second. And it's interesting that I saw Meredith's graph about integrating different sciences, and I'm here now talking about integrating different operational teams. Because in order for us to do this, each one of those teams is actually governed by some sort of science, right? The biodiversity team, that's natural science. Patrol teams, that's criminology, that's crime science. 
community, sociology, human wildlife conflict, back to the natural sciences. But what we're trying to encourage teams to do is look like this instead of looking like four different teams operating in the same landscape. Because when you do this, you get more options. You have more ways to pull the string or you can pull multiple strings at once. And a very quick example, a nice one out of Indonesia of people doing this, right? I'm not creating this brand new product. There's people who have done this before. They just didn't know that they were doing it or they were doing it intuitively, which is great, but it's hard to replicate. It's hard to replicate intuition. It's much easier to replicate systems. So this is out of Indonesia. You can read the paper by Holly Booth um, about the hunting of manta rays in East Indonesia. And it was a very, very specific problem, these enormous manta rays that were being hunted for their gills. So they scan and they pick that as a problem. Well, when they analyze the problem, they realize, okay, it's a single village that's actually doing most of the hunting and trading. It's a small group of, group of repeat motivated offenders. And it was concentrated around the full, the full and new moons when the mantas would aggregate in certain areas, okay? So you analyze the problem, and then you build a response that's tailored to that. And again, you got the hammer and they did use the hammer targeting patrols in the aggregation area, prosecutions of high level traders, but they also picked up the saw or the screwdriver, whatever other tool it was to think about things like a range of livelihood interventions to get people other options for income, community-based monitoring of what was going on. So you can actually assess if what you're doing is working. And what they see is that from a baseline in 2013 to 2017, they reduced hunting of these rays by 86%. And they see, observe a small amount of displacement, but really this is an example of how focusing gets you where you need to be. You're not looking at illegal fishing in that bay. You'd never get anywhere, right? You would never get anywhere if you did that. But if you pick a problem and stick to it and build an interdisciplinary interoperational team, you can actually do something. And the problem that we see now, and this is a, a drawing from uh, one of my friends when I was down in Kenya recently, is that we have this massive gap between what's going on in academia and what's happening in experience and practice in the field of wildlife protection. So even all these insights that we're making, Holly's great paper, the likelihood it's gonna make it over here, it's kind of low right now. And there's various reasons for that. I don't wanna go into it, but. For me, one of the most important things is how are we ever going to build an evidence about what's working, an evidence base about what's working until we do something about this, right? And I'm originally trained as a biochemist. And so when I was in a biochemistry lab, it was quite easy. I have a research question. I want to test something. I open a catalog and I buy chemicals. I buy equipment and I buy animal models of the problem I have, right? In a biochemical problem. In my wildlife protection lab, this does not exist. There is no catalog of people. I need to convince different people to join up, to rethink operations, to become part of a scientific experiment to see if it works. And that's not easy. We're talking about turning police officers or rangers into applied scientists, okay? And that's, what the, that's where the challenge really lies. And that's why it's, it's, it's sort of ironic I'm giving a keynote because I'm about to, to leave academia um, but this is why, it, starting in September, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm starting a new, uh, a new role with an uh, organization called Lead Ranger because we've identified that one of the best solutions to this problem is to start building a lot of capacity here. We need to be training teams and getting them on board with the ideas of, do we want to know what works? How would we do that? In order to make these applied scientists, unfortunately, they're not coming to Lida. They're not coming to the VU. They're not coming to Groninga. These people are in the field doing their job day after day, like the team I've got visiting from India right now, okay? They are the ones making decisions in the field that will ultimately provide us data to say, is it working, yes or no? Was that a good idea? Is this theory holding up? Because unfortunately, that's where it all happens. Not unfortunately, because the field is awesome, but that is where it all happens, okay? And the way we're gonna work on doing this is through education, mentorship, building case studies, using e-learning to reach broad swaths of people to start building foundations, but also very much linking ourselves in the POP Center because that's what we need to do. We need to be writing things that police and rangers can read to help them, to help prep them so that when the academic work wants to happen, we have reliable data. People understand why when you tell them to go patrol that area, but not that one, they don't look at you and say, well, I've seen minority report, I'm not doing that. They need to understand that this is how we build evidence. 
And they need to understand that that's also how their job gets better. It gets safer. It gets more effective. Probably many of you haven't been on a patrol, but they're terrible. Patrolling is not fun. You're walking around, possibly getting stamped on by elephants, looking for people who don't want you to find them. And if it's not working, why are we doing it? Right? And some of the work that Nick did in his PhD that you might hear about in the next session shows us that patrolling is very ineffective at finding snares. Okay, once we have that evidence, I can start making better decisions about how should my rangers be used? Maybe they should just be having coffee with everybody. I'm totally open to that, right? It's not about the tool, it's about the solution. Okay, and we need to find more solutions. So anyways, part of the vision then is of course, I don't wanna leave you all forever. I would like to come back at some point to the towers, but bring with me a group of motivated and talented people who have the training and skills to push the science forward that we want, okay? And also I wanna end on an optimistic point in the sense that by doing this, I wanna make it clear to everybody in this room, there's lots of opportunity to be studying this. Wil wicked wilderness problems are everywhere, including in Holland. We don't think we have a lot of wilderness. We don't have so much, but we do have wilderness problems. Where are they dumping all that ecstasy waste? In natural areas. We have wolves coming back into the Netherlands that are being persecuted immediately when they come back in. Why? Because people aren't used to having them. They're predating on sheep and other and cows and they get shot. So all the, all the work we're putting in Germany to saving wolves, they cross over and bam. And then there's like serious support in the agricultural sector sometimes for this because it is a threat to their livelihood. The wicked problem coming back and haunting us once again. But also, and hopefully, and I really hope this is a vision, an optimistic vision of the EU, I hope we're gonna have more wilderness, right? I hope as we leave sort of this state where we are now, we look and realize we need more carbon capture, we need more wildlife, we need more ecosystem services here because we can't just start undoing it all ourselves, okay? And in the words of a wise rapper, mo wilderness, mo problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, very nice. And now the floor is open, I believe, for the general discussion as you wish. So anyone who wants to jump in with a question or a remark. Jenny, go ahead. Who wants to respond to that first? I, Go for it. So I would, I would agree. Indeed, there's a lot of there's a lot of experimentation going on in policing, in wildlife protection. What there's not going on is a lot of writing that down. There's not a lot of people pushing together to get that into either. And again, this is where I've been asked to do case like a, a meta analysis of what works in poaching prevention. We don't have the literature, it's not there yet. We've been funding these teams for hundreds of like at least a hundred years, right? So I completely agree that we need to, we need to change how we're, we're, we're looking at, at practice in some ways, but we also, 
and this, it could be different in the Dutch context, but I'll be very, in the teams that I've worked with, there is zero incentive from donors, from management to be a part of a scientific exercise. Donors want, are paying people in conservation to do things, and that is very dangerous. If you're doing things without checking on them, and it's again, it's that one shot idea. So that, that's my own experience in, in where I would say, maybe I'm misunderstanding what, what, you're, what, you're, what you're getting at, but. Sure, but I, I completely agree. And that's why I'm taking a new role is to work on that. But the reality also is if you look at an NVAO funding scheme, applied science is a bad word in this country, unfortunately. And NVAO and social sciences, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm welcome to be wrong, but it is not necessarily seen as the most rigorous. And that's a problem. And I know NVAO, for example, is trying to change rewards and recognitions, but that's a, that's a high level decision that needs to be made. And I completely agree, this is something we wanna be focusing on. But when you go in for your tenureship or whatever, impact is not measured there. It doesn't matter if I saved an exotic species, it matters if I published it in nature. And that is where we start getting perverse incentives to focus on ourselves and on our publications rather than, than, than the impact. Because also many people working in enforcement or practice, they don't necessarily want to do the scientific side, but they are the scientists. They are the ones who are gonna be collecting the information and making the decisions in the field. So that's where I've struggled for many years on how do we realign those priorities and I agree, they need to be realigned, um, but I'm just, that's above my pay grade, basically. <laughs> if I could just add to that, um, in response to the question that you asked Andrew, um, uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a Jefferson Science Fellowship in the United States, right? And so the European Union and the United States in particular really do a lot of science diplomacy, right? And so the whole idea is that like science can unite people, right? And in, in, at a geopolitical level. now. I think conservation is cool, right? So, you know, when Eritrea and Ethiopia just signed their peace accords, one of the first things they did was throw a bunch of collars on elephants, right? And you have scientists collaborating across borders. Well, what is one thing that everybody wants to collaborate on? Crime reduction, right? And so when I go to these international crime statistics conferences, it's amazing to see, you know, people studying human trafficking, sharing statistics from Peru and Romania. It's, it's just, it's really neat. So I think that this idea of science diplomacy and training scientists kind of as diplomats and then also the diplomats for, for science could be, could be one way to sort of fill this. And the European Union has gone up in spades, I think with leadership with this and trying to promote this idea of you know, leveraging science, scientists and science as a diplomatic advantage. Um, should I turn to the question that you asked me about? So one of the things that, so, so I have young children um, and I, so some of this is based on my own lived experience, but I think that uh, internet literacy has changed society during the time of COVID. Um, and so I see new communities online. I see, um, you know, I was in Madagascar in March. I see just internet accessibility has boomed in part because of COVID. And I think that engaging individuals through online communities and recognizing that a lot of this kind of cyber physical connectivity has been reshaped is one way that we can um, try to do capacity building, try to engage different communities um, engage more diverse individuals. Um, and so that's one thing that gives me hope. But there are all sorts of other like downsides. I mean, like a gajillion, um, mm. like maybe a gajillion plus two or something. It, it, it's a lot, but um, I think that it's an undertapped resource. And I think, I think there's something there potentially. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, then I'm gonna snatch this opportunity to ask a question. Because, um, and you were there yesterday and you were not Andrew, but Helene de Koning said something very encouraging, yeah, talking about opportunity, opportunity said like 30 to 70% of change is due to human behavior, right? Which is sort of a very optimistic window you get, like, okay, there's a lot of opportunity. However, she said that the main obstacle was institutional. 
Could, can you can you place that remark? Do you do you recognize it? I mean, do you recognize it, Andrew? Yeah. Because because that's then the sort of leverage that we should attack or should grab or something. I don't know how you say it in English, but that's where we should intervene. So I would say in my experience as a researcher, practitioner, and also in science diplomacy, that it's not either or, it's and how, right? I, I don't think that one, I, I think it's all hands on deck with these, these issues with, with society. And I think criminologists know better than anyone, than any field, how hard it is to change human behavior, right? So in conservation, we're like, yes, we changed 1% of human behavior. <laughs> like, yes, we, you know, half, half a percent, you know, when we do evaluate. Um, and so, yeah, I think changing human behavior through voluntary means, through coercive means is one part of it. And we do have a lot of uh, institutions and governance systems that aren't working. Um, but we do have some that are working. So I, I do think this is where we really need this kind of cross pollination of what works and what doesn't work. Um, and I also think that in places like, you know, the Netherlands and in the United States, we don't have perfect institutions, but we can put a lot of faith in, in, in our institutions. A lot of the places where I work, institutions are not the way that we're going to kind of move toward the future. So I would say it's both and instead of either or. Mm -hmm. And I would say definitely the institutional constraint is something we think a lot about um, when you're working with, especially law enforcement, because many times how success is being measured is very different than how we would actually want to measure what's working. And when the head of a government agency for the last 50 years, this is how they've measured it, number of arrests, blah, blah, blah. That is a very hard mentality to change when you say, I don't even care about arrests because it doesn't tell me anything about the problem. So that, on the one side, that is very difficult. And I think in evidence-based policing, this is something that they struggle with a lot. But I'd say the other one that's less institutional, but more industry is when you think about larger environmental harms, the kind that you'd be looking at here in Holland, that's gonna be the biggest one is the, the, the industry that has made their money by spending the rules, if not completely abandoning them. And they have way more money than we do. And they have a lot more to lose than we do. And that is really, really difficult. And the fishing, we saw this a bit when we organized that conference a while back, but also even you know pollution that caused cancer 20 years later. And they don't want to admit they did anything wrong, but also the people who worked for the company it was their employer. So they're maybe, hmm, I don't know if I really want to. So I think industry, which is different than institutionals, but also a really big player here that can stop institutional change because many times they fund it. Any other questions? Yes, Hank, go ahead. Thank you both very much. I, I like to get uh, the analysis and the emphasis of uh, two sides, both uh, the uh, uh, side of science is changing and law enforcement technology is changing. But there's also the, the third part, uh, which is the society and the social finance, or to put it in my own language, the garden. And now you, Mary, you, you suggested here the scale of this problem is so immensely large. Uh, it, it starts with some quite large farm and then moves on the other side to Europe. So we, as one of these uh, bystanders, one of these kind, may think I don't really want to make such a mess. But on the other hand, we have examples of where environmental activism has helped us to be anti fur on the road. So, what's your opinion about that? Is there, there, there a reason to, uh, to work on, on that front as well? So I might say um, I do some work in Vietnam where we've been studying the ingredients to support what we were calling local guardianship kind of and, and willingness to engage. Um, and this was with regards to um, illegal snaring in a protected area. I was really excited to sit in on the bystander um, session yesterday because I learned, I just learned more about bystander research. So first of all, I think I don't know of anybody in conservation that's using the word bystander. So there's an opportunity there. That being said, yes, I think there's definitely an opportunity to um, think more about engaging different communities in 
um, kind of supporting conservation organizations or federal governments or um, you know, serving as informal guardians or, you know, in, engaging more in bystanders. So I, I as bystanders, um, and I, I've seen it work in Vietnam, we found women's groups, like, like unions, we found specifically women's unions and youth unions were highly motivated to um, serve more as, as, as local guardians. Um, and so now what we're doing is we're going back and we're gonna start, now, I mean, COVID, right? So we're gonna start going back and really trying to uh, put some, some resources behind the way that they think that they can better engage in the issue. And that would be not only in their own communities, which would be a geographic scale that's relatively small, but also the whole park, um, which is big. And then also thinking about the way that women's unions might be networked across the country and seeing if we can kind of take things to scale that way. Those are, those are some of the things that I've seen, um, but it's not kind of like done yet, if that, if that makes sense. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, there's, there's possibility there. Do you want one from me too, Hank? <laughs> so, and this comes back to where I would just fall on the, the specificity idea that we definitely have, sh we've shown success in targeting specific communities for specific conservation outcomes. For example, um, communities that might be using leopard skins or hornbills as part of ceremonial attire, ultimately then having discussions to say, we now recognize this is not sustainable and we will, we will accept synthetics, right? They've done this a couple of times in Southern Africa um, and they've done it a little, as an example from India I heard about yesterday, but the point being there, these are super specific examples of communities and the guardian, I would say the guardian is important, but also the handler. The handler on the crime triangle is something that has a lot of community sort of influence. And this is where you're talking senior chiefs or heads of churches or what it is that first we need to analyze which community we're talking about because saying, you know, I live in Amsterdam, I'm part of the Amsterdam community. It's just not true, right? Like there's many, many different networks within Amsterdam. Some might be involved in the problem, some might not. So if we can find those and find the sort of the, the, the best wheel to turn or the, the lever to pull, I think that's how we engage it because the broad level stuff, in some ways it backfires because you start labeling everybody as a problem person <laughs> in the community. Um, so that's how I would reflect on that is if we wanted to pick a specific <coughs> issue, we could figure out who might be the best guardians and Meredith pointed out some youth leagues or women's groups, or maybe it's a senior chief, but that's how I would approach that question. Any last question? Well, we are approaching Indian temperatures here in the boom. <laughs> if not, then I am ending the session by thanking you both so much and handing you a small present. And there is a second one, but I don't know where it is. It may be in your bag, Janine, the certificate. Yes, you're both going to get an insect hotel. Beautiful. Isn't that nice? And I think you can freely. Uh, import this in the US. <laughs> Thank you for your consideration. Yes. And you're also getting a certificate, uh, which is an adoption certificate of a very miserable chimpanzee. Um, that's, I mean, that's a long story, but they've heard it twice now. So I'll leave you to the session. Okay, so you're going to get that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.